glad glad you could be with us here on the uh, big video podcast, Nebraska Sunrise News. Dot com. And uh, I know a lot of people are freaking out about their gas prices, but I do want to let you know about a CDC mandate that has come out just within the hour. Uh, the CDC now is recommending that you wear your mask over your eyes when you fill your tank so you won't see what you're paying. Okay, so try to wear the mask over your face, even though, frankly, you'll still be able to peek through it, you know, because <laughs> eyesight and COVID are about the same size. So it'll be peeking right through there. Anyway, so listen, you know, um, here's what's so frustrating. I know you're frustrated about the gas prices. I'm frustrated about the sticky gas prices. Every single day I wake up and I go, Oh, gas prices are about five bucks a gallon and Putin is still running around in the Ukraine. I don't know who to trust. But listen, I want to bring something up. Where are our Republican office holders? Don't you think it's time for these elected officials to start being the person they are in their campaign commercials? You know what we need? We need an Operation Warp Speed for energy in America. Why aren't we seeing our very tough guy Republicans out there fighting for us? You know, they're always going to fight, right? Going to roll up the sleeves. I'm, I'm rolling up my sleeves. All right, that's really more Miami Vice, Don Johnson stuff, but I think you get the idea. But they're always going to roll up their sleeves. They're always going to fight for the values. They're servants of the people right now. They're not doing anything. They're, they're, they're nearly completely silent except for the typical obligatory expression of outrage. Then we go to phase two. Who do we blame? And then when we go to phase three of their nonstop crap, it is the how serious this is. And then, of course, they close off every time, elect us to the majority and we'll do something. We'll stand with you. Heard it. Heard it. Don't ever see it. Let me tell you why I know we need an Operation Warp Speed. Now think back during the COVID insanity that they were lying about. Um, remember when Donald Trump said, all right, we got to get our crap together and boom, what did he do? He had all these companies refitting their factories to make, uh, what was that? The breathers, right? Isn't that what it is? It's a breather. Whatever, big machine, you hook it up and you're breathing, right? They needed PPE equipment. What happened? Boom, Operation Warp Speed. People started producing PPE equipment. In other words, what happened was Donald Trump, as president of the United States, tapped into what Americans are known for, which is responding to emergencies. Let me give you an example. Remember in 2019 right here in Nebraska when the Platte River flooded, and started flooding everybody out of their farms and their property. And you had guys like Kim Wolf, the guy with the Husker helicopter. What did Kim Wolf do? He goes, well, I better go get my helicopter so I can go pull some of these people out of these floodwaters. And that's exactly what it did. He did that at his own expense. He flew all over the place, pulling people off their land. And I'm telling you what, I, I talked to him about it. There were some people, the water was literally rising up and he got them just in time. Nebraskans rallied for their fellow Nebraskans and fellow Midwesterners by the thousands. Remember, they were collecting supplies, collecting diapers, collecting clothing, inviting people into their home. America always responds. How about the Pilger tornado in 2014? Remember that one? Even Brett Michaels came in and, and did stuff. That guy got his very toned abs and smoky good looks to come in here with his headband, ball cap, and goggles to not only bring supplies to the people of Pilger, but he did a concert to raise money for them. America always responds. Remember Katrina? All right, that big, and I was in Houston when this happened. When there's an emergency, and I'll use Katrina as an example, Americans were flooding down to donate. All right, granted, some of them were going, hey, I never wear this anymore. We'll give it to them. But regardless, 
They were coming in and I saw, I witnessed it myself. My family, we loaded a van full of clothing, food supplies, baby supplies, and then we sat in a line for over an hour just to drop stuff off. The point I'm making is that Americans respond to emergencies and they respond fast and they get stuff done. If there's an issue, if there's a problem, they get it taken care of. The United States of America needs energy. Our economy runs on it. And if you'll notice this bunch of idiots we have in Washington, D.C. right now would much rather go get some filthy, nasty, dirty Venezuelan comedy oil or some dirty, nasty, oppressive, murdering Iranian oil instead of just tapping into the great resources we have. We were energy independent just a little over a year ago. We were exporting fuel. Why aren't we tapping into that now? And by the way, all you politicians, don't start telling me, well, the Keystone Pipeline, it's a pipeline. Yeah, it is. It's a pipeline. I get it. And it would take time to build it. I get that too. But don't use that as an excuse. Don't use that as an excuse not to get out there and start fracking again. Get out there and start drilling on federal lands again. Get out there and produce that energy that we all know is out there and ready to go. You know, every time I think about energy, and this attack on American energy, I always go back to a news story I saw where here's a brother who had just bought a brand spanking new truck. He was so happy because he had a rock solid job working on the Keystone XL pipeline. And then gropey Joe Biden shuffled into the Oval Office and right out of the box killed it, killed 11,000 jobs. And what did he say to you? Well, uh, they, can, they can go to work and do, you know, in the green job in, in industry. They're, there's going to be a lot of green jobs. Hey, man, this idiot has been in office over a year. I've seen no green jobs emerge, right? I wonder how many of those 11,000 pipeline workers that were laid off are now assembling batteries or solar panels or whatever bullcrap green job these people keep talking about. It ain't happening. Okay, so, you know, we can respond, we can overcome. If we were to unleash the power of American energy tomorrow, you'd see gas prices go down today. And they would manufacture, they would go get that energy, they would frack, they would drill, they would do all those things that energy guys do, and there would be energy flowing in this country. And that's what would scare the Russians. That's what would scare the chai -coms. That's what would scare uh, who all these punks. I'm so sick of this. And for these politicians to sit here and tell you, oh, uh, well, what you need is a green card. Let me show you a, a psychopath, in my opinion. Here is your energy secretary. Get ready. The energy secretary talking about the pain in the botox of high energy costs. Listen to this genius issues with the colonial pipeline ransomware attack but looking more holistically in a macro view how does this speed up the efforts at doe to move in more of a renewable direction since this is going to have an impact on people at the pump yeah i mean we obviously are all in on making sure that we meet the president's goals of getting to 100 percent clean electricity by 2035 and uh, net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and, um, you know, if you drive an electric car, this would not be affecting you, clearly. Uh okay, if, if you were driving an electric car, where the hell did that come from? We looked at this yesterday. Electric cars are like $60,000, $80,000 a piece. How can a guy, you know, it's interesting. I was just buying some uh, ch hot chocolate. I got some, where did I get that hot chocolate from? Was it at the, whatever. High V convenience store or whatever. Let me tell you something. First of all, don't get their hot chocolate, okay? It's tasted like friggin' plywood. I'm not kidding. I was walking around the office going, why does my hot chocolate taste like plywood? Then a carpenter comes in and goes, you got your hot chocolate in my plywood. All right, not really, but I had to throw that in there. But so I'm in there and I'm looking at the people behind the counter. Nice people. You know, maybe one or two too many trailer hitches coming out of their lip. But hey, that's their choice. And I'm looking at them, and I'm not kidding. I was looking at them, and I was thinking, 
I got a pretty good idea what they make here working at the convenience store. How the hell do they even afford gas for their car? And that's where we are right now with gas hovering around five bucks a gallon in our area right now. How many parents are going to have to figure out how to get their kids to school? How many people are now going to limit what they do? How many fathers? All right, here's a good one for you. What about all these people that are playing, uh, their kids are playing select ball? All right, that already cost a fortune. Now you're going to add $5 gas for all those parents who are having to travel all over the country so their kid can play select ball? That's just, you know, just a couple of examples of what people are facing right now. But I'm sorry, I, 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 don't, I don't see our leadership I don't see our leadership that is even engaged in this. All right, what are they doing? They're saying, oh, we'll just do some green energy. You know, if you had an electric car, you know, no. You know what I say? If you said that in front of me, you know what you'd need? You need to load up your electric car and head to your dentist office. I mean, give me a break with these people. Because this is why I'm so skeptical of this Ukraine situation in the first place. I'm going to be honest, I think this is here to nudge us. This is here to force us. Because who's getting hurt with these sanctions? Russia isn't getting hurt with these sanctions. The chai are already going to buy all their oil. So that's not going to hurt them. Who's getting hurt? You. Me. That's who's going to get hurt. Okay? That's who's getting hurt here. We're getting hurt in food costs. We're getting hurt in transportation costs. I mean, just think about it. How about this? What about uh, separated families or divorced families who have visitation on the weekends? Okay, it's already tough enough for parents because a lot of parents always got to compete with the other parent to have the cooler custody weekend. So now you just jacked them. Okay, how many people can afford to go to, say, the Henry Dorley Zoo and spend 15 bucks for gas just to drive there? This is affecting all of us, and our leadership, they don't care. You know why? Because what they're doing is they're implementing the new Green Deal without actually having to legislate, which brings me to yet another theory on my part. You know what I'm thinking about? You want to know a secret? Guys, you want to know what I'm thinking about? Tim and Sam, by the way, are producing the show today. I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about filing a lawsuit. I'm thinking about suing the Biden administration for their over-the-top, out-of-control restriction of my freedom by not tapping into American energy. Tell me why this is somehow greener to go to disgusting, nasty crude oil from Venezuela and when you could be producing cleaner oil right here in America. I think there's a lawsuit. You know why? Because our government is putting forth oppressive mandates and policies that are costing you and me money, yet we haven't had any due process on why they should be doing it, right? What do you mean, Chris, by due process? Okay, so they want to restrict us and tell us, well, we're not going to drill oil. You know, you just need to go buy uh, an electric car. All right, first of all, are there that many electric cars out there for sale? Are they telling us we have to sell the car we own so we can go get an electric car? Yeah, good luck with that trade-in. I I want to trade in my uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee to get one of those electric cars that barely travels 200 miles. Well, Mr. Baker, we're looking forward to do your trade-in. Here's what we're going to do. I did some paperwork here. I went and saw the manager back in the great Oz room. You ever notice that you go buy a car and like you're talking to the guy, then he goes back, he goes, well, let me go talk to the manager. Then he disappears for a while and he comes back and goes, no, (laughs) I think they're going to see Oz. Anyway, so they're not proving to us that any of these steps are required. Now, I know that you, some of you global warming cats out there, you buy into this, but if it's true, how come none of their predictions have ever come true? Remember New York was supposed to be underwater? It's not. Remember California was supposed to be underwater? It's not. I mean, none of their predictions have come true. The polar ice caps are going to disappear, said blockhead Al Gore. Did they? No. Okay? In fact, I always get a big kick out of every time, at least once a year you'll hear this story, where a bunch of moon bats will take the cruise to the Arctic to go see the Arctic 
and we're going to go to the Arctic Circle, and we're going to look at the seals and the polar bears and all that stuff. And then they get up there, and nine times out of ten, you know what happens to them? They get up there and get frozen in. And so then the Coast Guard has to launch an icebreaker to go get them out. All right? None of their predictions come true. Our government has to prove to us that the measures they're taking are needed. All right? Global warming is a, global warming is a theory. Climate change is a theory. Okay? It's a theory. It's not a reality. And guess what? There, there are other theories that counter that. So they should be proving this to us. If you want to, if you want to force me to spend five bucks a gallon for gas, then you need to prove to me that this is something we have to do because the planet is dying. Goya is dying. Wait a minute. Is it Goya? Do they call the earth Goya or is that a brand of beans? I'm trying to remember. Maybe it's both. Maybe the beans are having global warming. I don't know. Anyway, it's just stupid, and I'm sick of it, and I'm furious about it, and these are not serious people, all right? These people are using, they're using a catastrophe to implement a policy that they can't implement. And don't even say there's a mandate. There ain't no mandate. The Senate is evenly split with the vice president, that cackling vice president, who would break any tie votes. There's no mandate for any of this. And they should have to prove it, and I think I'm gonna file a lawsuit. And in fact, if I do, I will not only file that lawsuit, I will represent myself. Now, I doubt if I'll win, but that'll make some great television, I'll tell you that. (laughs) Anyway, all right, enough of that catastrophe stuff. We need Project Warp Speed for energy. All right, Donald Trump engaged in Project Warp Speed, and what do we had? We had all that equipment that we needed, right? With the what, what was it, the breathers? What are they? I can't remember what they call it. Ventilators, yeah. We don't have enough ventilators now. You got ventilators coming out the yin yang. You got now. You got people. They're probably somewhere on some home improvement channel. They're showing how to take ventilators and make lamps out of them. You know, probably potheads in in Colorado with their legal weed are probably getting all those old ventilators and like, hey man, watch this, we'll make a bong out of the old ventilator. Because you know, pothead will make a bong out of anything. <laughs> so we need Project Warp Speed for energy and you need to call your elected representatives, in fact, call all of them and just say, we need Project Warp Speed for energy, okay? Because that's what we need. now. I know the world is not all a bad thing. There's not a bad place. Here in Omaha, we got a really exciting event coming up this weekend, and you should get involved with it because it's all about art, it's all about Omaha, and it is an exciting event, I believe. What was it, the 19th year, I think it is? 17th. A 17th year. Well, what the heck? You know, we round it up. Anyway, 17 years, the Omaha Film Festival has, uh, has been going on, and it's always a really good time. Uh, joining us right now with the Omaha Film Festival, Mark Longbreak here. Mark, welcome to NebraskaSunriseNews.com. Mr. Baker, thrilled to talk to you. How's it going? It's fantastic, and I'm love very it. excited. I love the Omaha Film Festival, and uh, you guys do such great stuff, bringing films in from all over the world. Mm-hmm. Let us know what, first of all, tell us how things are going to go this year. I know there's some changes from past years, uh, and what kind of films are we going to see? Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a bummer, you know, the stupid pandemic just keeps raging on, but you know, it is what it is and we're, and we're pivoting with the rest of them. Right. Um, so this is our 17th annual, you know, we've been doing this for a while. Uh, yeah. This year we've got 111 films from around the world. Um, we've got a bunch of feature films, documentary short films. Unfortunately, 95% of that is virtual. Um, but I think that's one of the things that's, you know, it's, it's okay. I mean, people have been sitting around for two years watching Netflix and Hulu and Amazon and whatever else. So we're saying, hey, just for a couple extra bucks, you can watch some stuff that maybe you wouldn't have a chance to see anywhere else. Um, but one thing that we did this year is we've expanded the, the virtual um, broadcast period from March 13th through April 2nd. So they have three weeks to kind of go through um, all of that stuff. But um, we have secured a location for three days. Um, so starting uh, Thursday night, uh, which is tonight, uh, real time, I'm not sure when this will air, um, but at the Brownell Talbot Prep School um, right there in historic Dundee, 
Um, they've got an amazing 300 seat theater. Um, we used it for our 48 hour film challenge last fall. And it was, it was a great place to kind of do film events and speaking events and whatnot. So um, Thursday night, we'll have a writer's theater on stage, which is uh, seven of, uh, of our screenplay finalists. We're going to do live reads with those folks. Um, and then starting off on Friday evening, we'll do some Nebraska shorts and we'll have an amazing documentary, um, which we can talk about. And then Saturday, um, we've got th three short film blocks and uh, another amazing documentary that we're going to show. So we do have some in-person stuff. That's fantastic. And I, I'm a huge fan of uh, documentaries and I spend a lot of my time watching documentaries now. So uh, what's standing out right now as far as documentaries? Uh, you know, and what's funny that you mentioned that because uh, 17 years ago when we started this thing, like I don't think Omaha knew about or even cared about like what documentaries were. I mean, Netflix was I don't even know if Netflix was going. It might have started that same year. And I, I think by now, though, everybody loves docs. Right. I mean, back then it used to be just Michael Moore and that was kind of it that everyone knew about. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a ton of great stuff. So uh, Friday night, we've got a documentary called Fighting for Daybreak. Um, it's a, a gentleman that's uh, wealthier than we are uh, down in Oklahoma. He's like, hey, I want to start a music festival. So he's like, well, what kind of festival? Um, EDM. And he's like, he's an older gentleman, doesn't even like electronic dance music. But he's like, well, I think that would be a cool festival. So he built this entire like thing on his property to bring in this festival. And then one thing after another started happening bad for him. Like they had rains, um, like 12 inches of rain in 12, 12 hours. They had a tornado that touched down like a half mile from the location. And like people are, you know, flying in from around the world and musicians and to, to have this thing. So uh, a gentleman made a documentary about um, his experience two years ago. Um, they wow. survived, you know, they survived the, the that year. Um, and then the pandemic hit. So he, he's been dark for the last two years. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to, to him coming into town, the director and the, the gentleman that's in the movie. Um, are both going to be here Friday night. That's going to be at oh, wow. uh, 8, 10 p.m. Um, yeah, so it's... Uh, it, it's is, you know, I, I love the that idea for a documentary because, you know, as you're, as you're describing it to me, I'm just sitting here thinking they should have just called it the history of show business. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember one show that's ever gone off without a hitch. And just for, if you're watching right now, which by the way, all the cool people are, we just we were late to this interview because a tornado hit. No, not really. It was just a glitch. But wow, what a what a chain of catastrophes going on. But the festival still went off. Am I correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And and you know the the cool thing is uh, he he's going to be here. And I I'm after watching this hour and a half documentary about this guy and his life and everything. I'm just, I'm so looking forward to meeting him. Um, I've talked to him on the phone a handful of times, but he's just a, a interesting dude. Um, so to have him in the audience and then get up and do a and a afterwards, I think is going to be really illuminating. And, you know, it was their, their goal, their desire was to not have another fire festival. You know, they, they were like, all right, we're, we're going to do this. The show must go on and we're going to make it work. So, um, yeah, so yeah, it'll, it'll be a great show on, uh, on Friday evening. We're talking about the Omaha film festival and just give our audience an idea of how many submissions that you get. And out of that number of submissions, how many make the cut? Yeah, we, uh, you know, up until this last year, um, we're, we've been around a thousand, um, which is amazing. Like when we started this thing 17 years ago, you know, we thought, well, we're going to get Nebraska, Iowa, you know, maybe some Kansas City films. Like we never imagined that it would grow to the extent that it did. But yeah, we get close to a thousand entries every year. And then we have a big, Calling process that goes from May through at the end of December. I've got 24 judges that are watching all the films, like every minute of every film and um, judging them. And like, it's the whole, like, how do you judge art, right? How do you say one right. piece of art is better than the other? And um, yeah, so we, so we break that down. So the, obviously this year, um, the number of entries was down uh, pretty considerably because um, all the people last year, we had good entries last year because all those people had shot their film and were editing them and then entered the festival circuit. But this year it's like independent filmmakers with, you know, had to go out and get a job and they're not, they're not able to pay for yeah. entry fees for all these festivals. And um, so, but we're, st we were still able to, to pull, you know, together 111 of what I think are amazing films. And if you look at some of the big film festivals around the country, around the world, 
like we're showing some of the same you know documentaries and features and shorts so um so yeah i always I always put our festival up you know it's in terms of quality with with any all the big boys so yes yeah, it's a lot of good stuff doing a festival of all the of like the worst of the, <laughs> of the submissions and just call it the want to know how bad it can get festival <laughs> I, I think and I, I i guarantee our judges would be up for that and and so one of the things we do on our judges form is like I, I tell them, you know, be honest with me. You know, it's this is an internal document. It'll never go out to the, um, never go out to the filmmaker, and they embrace that. There's, there's, like the comments that I get, the stream of obscenity sometimes when when someone enters a bad film, um, it's uh, it's it's glorious and it's entertaining. Um, but yeah, certainly not for the outside world. And yeah, we would never do it. as far as any filmmakers or any screenwriters that enter. No, we absolutely love their project um, because every one of them is amazing. How's that? Um, you know, here's something else I think would be interesting, and that is, can you tell us a little bit about your filmmakers? Because I know a lot of people who they're working a day job and then at night they're working on their film. And, and a lot of these guys, they really, they got to juggle jobs and their creative process. Do you have any directors or or producers that that stand out in your mind that are people who are so committed to the art that they make extra. I mean, everybody makes sacrifice to make a film, but I love the stories of those people who are just, as I like to say, ham and egg in it. Yeah, you know, it, it, it runs the gamut. Um, what we have, yeah, we have especially the like the local, the Nebraska stuff. Um, you know, they're college students, or they're like a local production company that is doing commercials and shooting stuff on, uh, you know, on the day. And then on a weekend, they're like, let's go out and try and make a short film or, you know, let's make a documentary about a topic that we're interested in. Uh, so we run the gamut from, from those type of people of which there are countless, you know, around the world making just, you know, ham and egg. And like you say, um, two people that are like, all right, I'm going to dedicate my life to this cause about global warming or, or, you know, whatever the, you know, whatever the topic and then they jump in and they find funding and they and they spend six years of their life making a documentary. And, you know, so so we love both. We love hearing both of those stories because they're both amazing. Yeah. Well, the Omaha Film Festival, what I love is that after 17 years, people take you serious and, and they should because you've got serious directors from all over the world submitting to be part of this film festival. And for people that are watching right now, how can they be a part of the big film festival? Yeah, you know, the most obvious way, and I appreciate you stringing it by there, omahafilmfestival.org. Um, there's a button right on top that says, uh, you know, sc screenings. Um, and you'll be able to click on that. You'll be able to go through and look at trailers, um, see artwork, you know, read synopsis of all 111 films. Um, and then if there's a, a pass option. So if you want to get an all access pass, um, usually it's 100 bucks. I think this year we're only charging 75. That gets you into all of the physical stuff at Branagh Talbot this weekend, um, and then three weeks of all of the virtual. Um, if you want to do just virtual only from March 13th to April 2nd, 50 bucks um, gets you access to all those. Or if you just want to come to you know Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night at Branagh Talbot, um, you can plunk down 50 bucks and get an in-person pass as well. Um, or if you just you know read everything and you, and you like the looks of one documentary we'll charge you seven bucks and you can either see that in person or you know see a short film block it's only seven bucks usually we charge 10 but we want to try to save people some money because they're pumping uh 85 dollars into their gas tank to get down there so we figured we'd save them a few bucks at the box office right so yeah individual tickets both virtual and uh, in person seven bucks um and then all the pass options so omahafilmfestival.org check it out all right listen uh mark Again, congratulations, and uh, I'm, I'll, I'll be online pulling up. I love documentaries. But, you know, congratulations to you and, and your crew there at the Omaha Film Festival. 17 years is nothing to sneeze at, and it just gets better every year. And, and also, I just want to say a lot of guys would have quit. You know, a lot of guys would have quit with COVID and shutdowns and all these mandates and stuff like that, but you keep pushing through and that just, you know, I think speaks volumes for, for your work ethic and, and obviously your devotion to the art of making film and best of all, highlighting one of the greatest artistic cities that no one really knows about, Omaha, Nebraska. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and just to, to your point of quitting, I think I, wa I wanted to quit three times last week. Right. So, uh, yeah. but we didn't. So yeah, the show must go on and you know, it's, it's not about us. It's about um, the opportunity to highlight uh, what filmmakers uh, locally and around the world are doing. And um, we're more than happy to put that content in front of people. So um, yeah, so it's totally worth it. So yeah, we appreciate yeah. your support every year. Um, sure. And yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're glad to see you. Thank you. Real cool, Mark. Uh, Mark, long break. Thanks a lot, man. And uh, best of luck to you this weekend. Everybody go to omahafilmfestival.org. Get your tickets, get more information, and be a part of this. This is our wonderful city, and we get to share it with all these great filmmakers from around the world. Thanks a lot, Mark. We'll Thanks, talk Chris. Appreciate it. So the Omaha Film Festival is a really great thing. You should get involved. And here's the other deal. You can really do the Omaha Film Festival like you've been doing most movies these days from home. So a lot of it is online. And as you heard, there's a couple events. So that's really, really cool. All right. Back to the insanity of the world. I saw this video and uh, when I saw who it was, I was even more creeped out. Now, you know, in Florida, they, they passed a parental rights bill where you're not allowed to start telling children about, you know, and, and encouraging them to begin their long sex life journey uh, in kindergarten through third grade, right? So they pass a parent's rights bill that says you can't be ragging the kids and bringing up all this sex crap to kids from kindergarten to third grade. It's a rational thing. Kids don't care about that stuff at that age. They really don't. But, well, just... Watch this video, and, and then I'll tell you who this is. Uh, I think if you look up grooming in the dictionary, you'll probably find this video. All right. I pledge my heart, I pledge my heart to the rainbow, to the, rainbow of the not so typical gay camp, of the not so typical gay camp one camp, one camp full, of pride, full of pride, indivisible, indivisible affirmation and equal rights for all. With affirmation and equal rights for all. Watch it out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is what parents are upset about. They don't, they don't want their kids being groomed. And to mock the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America, a lot of guys have died for that, which is just, it's just despicable. Now, you know who that teacher was? That would be the husband of one energy, or excuse me, transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg. That's right. That's his husband, Pete Buttigieg. What's, uh, what is his name? Um, Chastin. Chastin? Chastin. Wow. Chastin wow. Glesman. I'm just curious. Does, does a, <laughs> can a name make you gay? <laughs> Yes. I mean, I'm just wondering. Yes. Chastin Buttigieg. <laughs> wow. That's, you know what that sounds like? A diabolical criminal mastermind. <laughs> well, you saw the video. You amuse me, Mr. Bond. Yeah, don't worry about me, Chastin Buttigieg. He just, <laughs> you, know, you know, one thing you won't hear, you won't hear, and, you know, like the beginning of, remember the old college football when they would do the lineups and the guy would get in front of the camera and you won't say, you won't see Chastin Buttigieg, linebacker. You know? <laughs> I mean, that, that's a name that almost sounds like a wind chime. You know? <laughs> Chastin Buttigieg. Oh, boy. Wow. Yeah, I bet that guy's got some scars. You know, Chastin Buttigieg. Anyway, whatever. I know I'm horrible and frankly, I don't care. So what do you say? Let's get a little advice. How about that? You know what it's time for? Time for a little moon bad email here on the Chris Baker podcast. And we don't have our moon bad email theme yet. Oh, that's right. Now, you know what? I just thought about something. We got to do the clapping from uh, from Edward Scissorhands. We had that video the other day. What was it? That guy. Always clapping. You have to stop. Really? You know, I bet you'll never hear this. Chastin Buttigieg, get out there and replace my alternator. <laughs> ah. 
You won't hear. Well, we're moving into a big development. Really? Well, well tell me about the homes. Well, they're Chastin Buttigieg homes. It's a very butch guy. You'll never hear Chastin Buttigieg welding. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this will never go away. You know that, right? Local iron workers, 427's leader, Chastin Buttigieg, came out today in support of a strike. <laughs> Navy SEAL Chastin Buttigieg just rescued a thousand Ukrainian children. <laughs> I wish I could spin this camera around. <laughs> Chastin Buttigieg sounds like some kind of some kind of foreign dish that you would get in Morocco. When we were in Morocco, how was the food? It was amazing. We had this thing made, it was like with lamb and couscous. It was, I think it was Chastin Buttigieg. <laughs> Though I think Pete Buttigieg once did eat Chastin Buttigieg under glass. So I'm not. <laughs> We're horrible. All right. It's uh, time for some Moonbat email here on the Chris Baker Show. Moonbat email, of course correspondence from incredibly intelligent people who have a lot of great advice. Dear Chris, are you on the radio? Heard you had a new show. Can you tell me where it is so I can start calling your sponsors? <laughs> sure. Go right ahead. It's at NebraskaSunriseNews.com. Go ahead and call our sponsors. Anyway, here we go. Email number two. Dear Chris, why do you Repugnicans, oh, that's so cute. Why do you Repugnicans keep saying that we were energy independent a year ago? Uh, Cause we were, oh, I'm sorry. Why do you Repugnicans keep saying that we were energy independent a year ago? Who cares what the price was? We are still dependent on oil. The only way to be energy independent is to get out of cars and into electricity. You're such a liar. Um, anybody want to tell this guy where energy comes from? Just electricity? Anybody want to know? Is he, does he just think like a bunch of people are out flying kites with old skeleton keys tied to them? You know? Oh man, I got to fill up my car. Well, here we go. Just here, tie the kite to the car with the skeleton key. That'll charge it. All right, last one. All right. Dear Chris. How can you ask Pete Ricketts why he doesn't want to help people with rent assistance? The feds are offering the money, so why not take it? Why are bald guys so evil? White bald men are the most evil people ever. <laughs> White bald. You've seen too many Bond movies. White bald. Let me tell you something about white bald men, okay? White bald men are good men. All right, white bald men are courageous men. You know why? They walk around every day bald. All right, white bald men have to sit back and listen to their full headed hair buddies bitch about, oh, I'm getting gray in my hair. Oh, it's going gray. Wah. Let me tell you something. My hair didn't go gray, it just went. Okay? So shut up. Anyway, there you go. <laughs> There's your. There's your moon bat email here uh, on the Chris Baker radio program. Now we need to have you some have some good stuff for you, okay? And you know I, I'm a big uh, uh, justice guy. I want bad guys put in prison, but the other side of it is that I want bad guys to go to jail, but I want them to get out of jail and be functional members of society. I want that guy who got out of jail and became a functional, productive member of society, I'm ready to have that guy be my neighbor. I mean, he can teach me how to make liquor. Anyway, I'm, I'm kidding. All right, you know I'm a big radio nut. I love broadcasting, and I just heard about something fascinating, a prison radio show that I think done by prisoners. I gotta know more about this, you know, because as soon as I find out how, then I'm gonna run in there and tell everybody what to do.
That, that's how it works here on the Chris Baker Show. Joining us uh, right now, Brent Nichols with the University of Colorado Prison Initiative. Uh, Brent, welcome to the Chris Baker Show. Hi. Hey, Chris. Hey. It's great to be with you. And it's actually Denver that's University, actually. just for accuracy. Yeah, it's actually Denver University, just for accuracy. Oh, Denver. Well, we don't want to get that wrong. Denver yeah, University. Two different schools. There we go. And this one's obviously the better school. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tell, tell me about the uh, University of Denver Prison Initiative. Yeah. So um, the Prison Arts Initiative is an organization affiliate, affiliated with uh, Denver University that has been doing artistic justice work um, in the Department of Corrections here in Colorado for some years, I believe about at least five years now. Um, so they do classes, they do theater productions and uh, a newspaper, it's called Inside Report. And more recently, kind of the most recent kind of permutation of our work, yeah, is the uh, radio station, as you mentioned, Inside Wire, Colorado Prison Radio. You know, that's a great idea. I, I really think that's a great idea. And do they just broadcast for the facility or is there a network? No, that's the amazing thing, actually, is this is the first statewide um, prison radio broadcast. So it's broadcast um, number one in all the facilities across uh, all the correctional facilities across Colorado, um, including the women's facility um, and also is broadcast online worldwide. So it's we're also the first prison radio station produced for prisoners by prisoners that's available to the world. So we're pretty we're pretty excited and pretty proud of that. And so tell me, you know, I'm a, I'm a radio veteran guy. So tell me uh, who decides the format and who decides who gets to be the on-air talent. Right. Um, so it's been kind of an ongoing collaborative process. Obviously, we work really closely with the Department of Corrections. Um, so as far as, you know, a lot of the standards that we have to hold to with our shows and the language and the content and that type of thing, uh, it's definitely a a uh, huge process of coordination with the Department of Corrections. Um, in terms of the staff, um, you know, prisoners inside all have jobs. So this was basically presented as um, as, a, as an option for a job and people applied for this like they would any other job and were vetted um, in similar fashion um, as they would be for any other, any other job. So uh, that's kind of how we ended up sourcing all of our producers from inside um, who we have at three different facilities currently. Um, hopefully, you know, in the future, we'll be able to expand that. And you have, st you have studio facilities right in the prison, right? Right. It's, it's pretty amazing. Actually, I went down there last week for our launch um, to the Lyman Correctional Facility. And for the first time I got to see the actual studio that they put together there. And it's, it's just pretty, pretty amazing, pretty mind blowing. Um, that they're they're able to not only one pull it together and actually have all the the hardware and the infrastructure that they need in there to accomplish this, but also that they've managed to pack away all the knowledge and learn what it actually takes to produce these shows and have them sound professional. And tell me, what kind of shows are they doing? Is this music radio? Do they do any kind of talk shows? And and are there any restrictions, being that these guys are incarcerated? that limits them from doing anything as far as a radio show? Sure. So right now it's a mix of um, talk and music. I would say probably more heavily weighted on the music end of things right now. Um, so we definitely have a number of shows. We have a morning show um, that's produced by a different producer every day. Um, then we have an, an evening show that's kind of an encore of the last hour um, of the morning show that airs again in the evening. Um, and we have other various music shows. We also have um, interview shows. We uh, had a kickoff. Part of our inaugural uh, launch day kickoff was an interview with Dean Williams, the director of the Department of Corrections. So that was things like that are really cool to see residents actually get to interact with the director and have a you know a one to one conversation with the director. Um, we have a show called Hotlines, which is kind of a some little news bites that are sprinkled throughout the day that are actually relevant to residents inside. It's not, you know, just news from the outside that doesn't actually affect their lives. It's actual content that, you know, that they can actually use in there. Um, we have a few other shows. We have a show called one tune, which is really fun. One of the more fun ones for me, the, the concept kind of being, if you were stranded on a desert Island or stranded out in space and you could only take one song with you, 
you know, what song would you take? So, you know, the producers will bring in residents and pose that question to them and sit down with them for an interview and kind of talk about the resonance, you know, the meaning of that particular song to that person. So it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice range of, of content, you know, for people. And is this, uh, are there just shows that air at specific times of the day or is this uh, kind of a 24 seven deal? So it's it's 24/7. We do have a regular program schedule which is available on our our website coloradoprisonradio.com. Um so yeah, it, it rotates. We do have a it kind of repeats weekly but we substitute out, you know, new uh new episodes each week for all the various shows that we have um just to kind of keep things fresh so people don't get, you know, bored. And yeah, it's it's 24/7 which is pretty amazing. I mean, given that um it is in the Department of Corrections, we do have to produce everything ahead of time. So we kind of produce it in a way to give it a live feel. But given that we have to have everything approved by the Department of Corrections, we're not to the point yet where we're actually able to do things live on the fly. And are there, well, I guess some of these guys are gaining some skills they can use on the outside because once they get out of prison, they could you know, apply at a radio station, or they could even start putting out their own can uh, excuse me, start putting out their own content, content. Uh, by the way, do your guys have a one second delay in their ear that, that throws them completely off and any of that? No, they don't. <laughs> Look at that, Jim. The prison radio has better so technology. Say they're, they're on prison time. <laughs> I mean, man. Can we get your engineer over here to help us with our audio? I'm telling you. It's just <laughs> but I mean, but you're, you're really, you're preparing these guys with a, with a 21st century skill because everybody has a podcast. I mean, anyone can do a show now online. So have you heard from any of these guys where they're saying, you know what, when I get out, I think I'm going to go dominate the world with my own show. Oh, absolutely. We have producers who would like to make a career of this when they get out. And that, for me, is one of the most amazing things is not only providing a platform for people inside while they're inside and allowing them to reach out and allowing the world to reach back in, but then also preparing them because a lot, a lot of these men and women are going to get out. I myself was formerly incarcerated and I know how difficult it was, you know, getting out and trying to get a job and trying to convince people to give me a chance. So to be able to, to walk out of those doors and have these kind of credentials, you know, on your resume to actually have a, something that you can put on a resume, um, I feel like is, is pretty, it's a pretty amazing, a pretty amazing thing, really a gift. Yeah. Are you bringing in any uh, radio veterans to kind of come in and give advice or to critique or anything like that? We haven't done a ton of that yet. We've had uh, one person from a local radio station come in and kind of school us on some various aspects of broadcasting. Um, Definitely something that we would like to kind of cultivate, you know, down the line is to just bulk up in any way we can and professionalize things in, in the, any way that we can really, you know, we're just kind of having a lot of fun trying to figure out how you even do this, you know, since nobody's ever done this before. Right. So yeah, definitely, you know, definitely looking forward to, to finding allies and, you know, finding partners and, you know, people who kind of share a vision and share a mission with us. Well, I think this is a great idea and I'm really glad to hear it. You know, I, uh, I work a lot with criminal justice and, you know, in another, uh, 501 C three that I have. That's great. And, uh, one of the big things that, that we find is that, you know, when these guys are locked up, there's doesn't seem to be a lot of effort to help them build a lot of good marketable skills. So, uh, this is a fantastic idea. Now, are there any talk shows where they can air, you know, uh, prison life experiences or maybe uh, advise new inmates on kind of the rules and regs and maybe like, a, I don't know, like a Dr. Laura of the prison shows? Do you have one of those where they just give advice? That'd be kind of fun. We don't have any specifically like that yet but that's definitely again 100 percent in the spirit of kind of what we're trying to do like i said you know we're trying to do radio by prisoners for prisoners so that would absolutely absolutely i think be something we joked um joked around in a, not an interview i was on but that my boss and one of the producers was on they joked about having uh something along the lines of yelp reviews for the uh, canteen food which would be great <laughs> <laughs> 
that would be really funny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean we all know where the, what direction those would go in. You could have a chop show. <laughs> oh, that would be amazing. I mean, some pr prison cooking can be pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, I mean, I know, you know, just from talking to various guys that have been incarcerated, they they actually are very resourceful with 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 limited supplies. That would be a man that might make it for people on the outside. Oh, they definitely know how to do it up like a nice spread in there for sure. With, you know, like you said, with the limit limitations that you have, you do what you can. Yeah. Well, listen, I think this is great. Good for you uh, for for doing something like this, because. There's two, there, to me, there's just, there's two ways that this could be very helpful. It, it gives people on the inside something to identify with. You know, they're hearing a voice that's just like them, that goes through the same things that they do. And yeah. it also can be a resource for people who need to get stuff off their chest or, you know, they can, you know, you know what you need. I tell you what you need. You need a prison rush Limbaugh. That's what you need. <laughs> These wardens don't know. <laughs> I can just hear it now. That'd be awesome. Well, listen, consider me as a resource. I'd love to help you out as you put this thing together. I've been doing this for a pretty long time, and I want to see these guys get out of jail and have marketable skills and never have to go back again. Well, so, we'd, love to, we'd love to hear that because that's what, that's what we're trying to do too, Chris, is just show people, you know, that people are still in there living human lives, you know, having a human experience. And like I said, a lot of them are going to get out and be part of our community again. So let's you know, let's try and have people come out as the best version of themselves that they can, you know, rather than a broken version. Yeah, good. Uh, good for you. Uh, this is this is really cool. And hopefully the state of Nebraska will rip off your idea. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we've started some kind of a trend here. That's what we can hope. Fingers crossed. Right. And it's awesome to have allies like yourself, Chris. So it's really great, you know, to have people like you highlighting what we're doing here. Listen, my pleasure to help out anytime. Feel free to reach out. Uh, I think this is a great idea, Brent, and, and good for you. And you know what? Here, and let me just say this as an example. You just said you were incarcerated. Right. You're no longer incarcerated, and look what you're doing with your life. So good for you. It's, it's amazing. And that's, I guess, something I should note, too, with uh, the DU Prison Arts Initiative is not only are they reaching back inside and creating opportunities for people inside, but it's changed people's lives like mine as well and given me an opportunity to not only use job skills that I have and technical skills that I have in, in audio production, but also use my experience in prison, you know, as a resource as an, and an mm -hmm. asset for, for other people going through similar things. Yeah. And I got to ask, because I know the audience is going, all right, what were you in prison for? Yeah, for, uh, for mushrooms. That's it? That's it. <laughs> That's yeah. That's the reaction I get a lot of times over that. <laughs> How'd that go over in prison? You know, so when you got I, am, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, I definitely got some chuckles in prison too over that. <laughs> room bandit. Yeah, wow. yeah. that actually nothing to laugh about. You went to prison over that, so. Hey, it, it was it was a long time ago, so we can laugh about it now. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen. Really happy to hear about what you're doing. And again, please consider me a resource because uh, I like to see everybody better themselves. And, and Brent, God bless you, man. And keep up the good work. Hey, thank you, Chris. We really appreciate you and your time. Sure. To you we'll talk to you. We, we need to check in periodically. Let's do that. Let's Yeah, let's not be strangers. Can we interview some prisoners? Um. You know, answer now no, I can't promise because i'm not the department of corrections but we have done things like that from the inside we would it would take a little coordination with my boss and we'd have to set up we probably would have to use google meets or something like that some kind of a video cap of that but yeah that would that would be amazing because chris really like i said it's great to have allies like you and i feel like we're going to be doing big things so i think it'll be worth your while to check in and see where we're at you know absolutely absolutely all right take care brent appreciate hey, your time today. you too chris have a great day all right. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Look at that. Prison guys doing radio, which, frankly, I've been in radio for 30 years. There's a lot of guys in radio that should be in prison, frankly. But, you know, I don't want to name any names. All right. I could name names. Maybe I will name names. Maybe it'll be your name. Maybe I'll name your name. What do you think of that? You can send your shoebox full of 20s to Chris Baker at NebraskaSunriseNews.com. Well, my thanks to Brent Nichols, and I think this is a really great thing that he's doing. The only hazard I see is that if you're doing the prison radio show, be careful in the chow hall, because I'll guarantee somebody's going to come up and go, hey, 
you didn't play my request. That always happens. There's always somebody ragging you. Hey, how come you didn't play my request? So, all right, regardless, let's get out of here with another fine example of leadership. All right, so just to keep score, we got a war in Ukraine they're trying to draw us into. The war in Ukraine is literally distracting from the chaos and invasion on our southern border. People, fentanyl, methamphetamine, all these drugs are flowing into our country right now. And our political establishment, they are not even paying attention to it. They're already, they're on the Ukraine bandwagon, okay? But if we're going to have people trying to make a difference in this, can we not send this crazy old bag? Here's Nancy Pelosi. Just, just check this out. I spoke to President Zelensky. I said, Billie Jean King sends you her regards and wants to know how she can help in an event. <laughs> Billie Jean King. Billie Jean King. So she's telling the, I'm sure Zelensky is meeting with his cabinet right now. Listen, we got everything under control now. This thing's going to be over really quick. Billy Jean King is engaged. Does he even know who she is? I mean, you think Zelensky's running around right now, the Ukraine, talking to his, his military leaders going, yeah, I don't know exactly what this has to do with anything, but apparently the chick in that Michael Jackson song that, that said that he fathered a kid is going to help or something? Billy Jean King. I mean, if you want to bring a tennis pro uh, in to help out, you know, fight off a Russian invasion, get one of those crazy predator-like Williams sisters out there. Those tennis rackets, they can be batting back bombs and bullets. I mean, there you see that commercial, bombs and bullets and missiles. Kapayow, kapayow, double backhand, boom. The friggin' Billy Jean King. What? What kind of guy? I mean, here's the, I mean, think about it. You're you're the president of Ukraine. You got the Russians all over the place. They're blowing stuff up. They're launching missiles, and you know they sent a hit squad out for you. And here comes the Speaker of the House. By the way, third in line for the presidency. If you weren't freaked out enough as it is, and her great comment to you is. I call Billie Jean King, you know? I mean, why'd you stop there? Oh, you know who else I called? James J. Bullock. We got him coming into town. And uh, I think Suzanne Summers too. She's gonna come here, gonna thigh master the Russians out of your country. I mean, <laughs> give me the phrase. You know, you gotta get, get the sham wow guy on there too while you're at it, you know? Hey, hey, look at that. Hey, you getting this Russian guy? The sham wow. It's a sham wow, you tank. <laughs> I'm serious, man. The whole world's cracking up, and we're here to chronicle it here on the Chris Baker Show on NebraskaSunriseNews.com. Did I?